time is it? Well, I guess we missed. I'll take you anyway. Okay. Okay, good morning, everybody. How's everybody today? One person is doing good. That's fantastic. Uh, Bertha, you're up. Awesome. Hey, guys. How's everyone doing? I just want to talk about Lunch of a Lifetime um, in Calgary, which will be happening at the shelter next week. Um, so the uh, if you could RSVP by... Friday, that would be great just so we could get numbers. Um, you've probably seen posters around. It's the experience. Um, that's what we're titling it this year. So it's going to be, um, yeah, a lot of team building um, activities and exercises to get you to know more about the shelter. So that'll be really good. So if you could please um, get online and RSVP, we'll be sending out another email tomorrow. Um, and uh, yeah. Fantastic. You guys, I'm, honestly, they don't let me in on the planning on this thing, but they let me kind of hang out just to know what's kind of going on. It's going to be fantastic. You don't want to miss it for anything. Shirley's just going to talk to us about next week's speaker, and then Dean is going to introduce today's speaker. Good morning. I want to encourage you all to come next week for sure. In fact, bring someone. We have Deborah Close, who is um, a donor of the Mustard Seed, and she has a personal story in leadership that I think is really one that we want to hear. And so I just encourage you to please come, bring someone, encourage others in your team, and uh, let's support our donors by listening to their story. Thank you. has been my buddy for uh, nearly 25 years. Um, my wife and him actually went to high school together. So that's how far back we go. And uh, he is executive director of UCAN, which is an agency that works with um, marginalized youth in our city. He started it. They do exceptional work. Uh, Kyle got into this line of business well before I did. And um, as such has become somewhat of a, of a teacher to me, someone I've learned from, someone that I share ideas with and uh, is, is a friend and a colleague and uh, one of my favorite people. He loves U2, Bono, uh, the Edmonton Oilers. Uh, he's married and has three sons who um, are all athletic and uh, bright and, and great kids. And I don't, is there anything else to say about you? And he's ruggedly handsome. <laughs> <laughs> ruggedly handsome, yes. All right, so welcome Kyle as he comes on up. Hi everybody, thanks for having me. Uh, you'll probably look, after I talk, you'll look forward to next week's speaker, Deborah, I think her name is, so I, I hope that uh, that goes well next week. Dean, thanks for asking me to come and talk. Chris, thanks for being on time. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, no, you need more than that, trust me. Uh, listen, Dean, Dean asked me, uh, this is weird for me knowing that this is all happening, because I'm going to tend to want to look there, and I, I, so I apologize already. Uh, but uh, Dean asked me, a while ago to do this and then I think we both forgot about it until about a week ago and then uh, connected again to make sure that I was going to come this morning and Dean basically from what my understanding is wants me to come and talk about uh, who we are as an agency what we do and also why I do what I do and, and uh, as far as my faith goes and, and why that's important in the role that I have so I'm the executive director of you can use services here in Edmonton we've been operating just about 15 and a half years uh, in the city. We, the first probably five years, we were quite quiet with the work that we did. We were very small, it was myself and about 20 volunteers. And over that time, we've grown uh, to an agency that works with, with at-risk young people. Uh, we consider youth between the ages of 12 and 24. And we focus primarily on employment and also keeping young people in school or getting them back into school. Um, keeping them in school is actually not too hard because if they're there, they're already ahead of the game and that's good. 
getting them jobs. We're actually really good at getting them jobs. Um, they're not very good at keeping them, to be honest with you, so we have to continually be working with them. <laughs> getting them back into school is actually probably our hardest job because many of the young people that we work with have been kicked out of most schools in the city and for them to get back in is tough. So um, primarily most of the work we do is based on employment. The young people we work with come from some pretty bad backgrounds, um, some pretty nasty places to be honest with you and they've been rejected and neglected and abused in many ways. A lot of them come from the gang life, a lot of them come from prostitution life. A lot of them come from the same type of areas where you folks are working at in all the different communities that you're at. And um, our job really is to bring them in, try to care about them and get them moving forward in life. Um, we try to have them take responsibility for some of the things that are happening in their lives while they also realize that some of the things that happen in their lives is not their fault. It's they, they weren't asked to be born into the situations that they were born into. So what we're trying to do is get them into the mindset and, and the realization that they do have potential and that they can get out there and, and uh, be successful. And we throw around the term economically independent quite a bit. So in a nutshell, that's what UTAN does. Uh, we work probably directly with about 300 to 400 young people every year. Um, and that's where we're doing continual work with them. And then we probably have close to a thousand uh, that we do one-off stuff with in the schools and, and with some of our outreach work that we do. So I've been there for 15 and a half years. Um, I've been very privileged to see the organization grow. We now have myself and about 20 staff. Um, so we've grown substantially uh, in that time. But we're still, well, I guess we're not small. I guess we'd be considered a medium-sized uh, organization, but we're not, we're not a, a big machine by any by any means, and we kind of like the size that we're at. So, so over the years, uh, I've been here, and my whole career uh, has been working with that risk youth. And qu quite often, I get asked, "What brought you into this line of work? Why do you do this?" And and um, I do come from a, a faith background. Uh, that's where Dean and I actually met. Uh, that's where Chris Knutson and I actually met, was through uh, going to the same church. And I was raised in the tough, tough streets uh, of St. Albert. And that's... Uh, <laughs> truly, I was raised in the, the tougher streets of St. Albert. Um, if you're familiar with St. Albert, in, in the S's, which is a little tough. Uh, and I now live in the hood of St. Albert, which is the Aikensdale area. Um, so anyways, I, I, I interestingly enough, uh, don't understand uh, all the stuff that the young people that I've always worked with go through. Um, my parents are good people. You know, we had our struggles like everybody else does. Uh, it's all relevant, of course, but we had our ups and downs, our struggles, and we've had our own issues within our family, uh, immediate and all the other yahoos that are involved with us. But for the most part, I came from a home where my, my parents loved me. They, they love each other. Um, I was afforded some good opportunities. And, and uh, you know, I now have an amazing wife and three pretty awesome sons. And we've tried to afford them some, some opportunities as well. So I don't come from where a lot of these folks that I've worked with over the years come from. But I've always been, and I didn't realize it when I was young, I guess a social justice guy is the best way to put it. Um, I was big into justice. I was big into things need to be fair. I questioned a lot of things growing up, which didn't always bode well for me. Uh, I didn't like when people abused their authority or their, their power, everything from teachers to hockey referees. I could probably go on for hours on stories <coughs> of different times I was in trouble for that type of stuff. But I really felt that if you have power and if you have a responsibility to work with people, uh, you need to take that seriously. And you need to be able to make sure that you're working with all types of people. And I've always been a fan of the underdog. That's been my thing. So when I was in high school and trying to figure some stuff out, I, I had an amazing youth pastor come into my life. Um, we had gone to the St. Albert Alliance Church for years, but I didn't really pay much attention. I was just there more so my mom was happy. And this guy came into my life. He was an awesome guy. Uh, he treated me well. He, he was cool. He liked you too. Uh, he liked motorbikes, and we really connected. He built a relationship, and he led me to Christ. And it was a very, very powerful time in my life. Um, I then decided that I was going to be a youth pastor. Went to Canadian Bible College, and I lasted one term. 
Uh, <laughs> I then decided I didn't want to be a pastor, or maybe it, you know it was decided for me um, because it just wasn't uh, a road that I wanted to go down. And and uh, I always say I learned more about doing pranks in the dorms there than anything else. But we, uh, I, I always had this longing though to work with young people, and for me it was. It was based on a on an interaction that I had with a homeless guy in St. Albert. Now, some people go homeless in St. Albert. That doesn't happen, but it does happen. And there's a lot of homeless people in St. Albert, actually. Um, not as visible as you'd see in the downtown area of Edmonton or, or other communities, but definitely they are there. So there was a, a man named Louis, who was probably St. Albert's most famous homeless guy throughout the years. Um, I had seen Louis as I was growing up at different places in the city. Quite often he was he was either drunk or he was high. He liked to sniff, and um, Louis would, if you were at a store, he would always ask you for money. And so one day, I don't even know why I did this when I was 18. I said, Louis, I'm not I'm not going to give you any money, but do you like pizza pops? I was at 7-Eleven, and he said, I like pizza pops, and I said, okay. Uh, so I went in and bought him a couple pizza pops, and and as you can see, I like pizza pops a lot and uh so i bought myself some pizza pops and we had a big gulp and we talked for two hours and louis told me his life story louis told me about his childhood and foster homes and the abuse he went through and louis had no reason to lie to me so i i really believe that he was being genuine in, in the way he talked to me and the beautiful thing about louis is louis told me how i can do anything i want how i can pursue anything that I want, and I have all this opportunity, and, and he really inspired me, actually. This homeless guy having a pizza pop with me inspired me, and it was very moving for me, and, and it was a, a time in my life that I look back at often, and, and I remember him. I, I don't know. I think Louis passed away by now. I mean, I haven't seen Louis in years and years and years. And, um, he had probably one of the most, well, probably one of the biggest impacts of anyone in my life. And I always found that really profound that this homeless guy could do that for me. And I realized right then and there that I want to work with people. I want to work with underdogs. And I believe that, especially at the time, you know, I mean, I was pretty involved with the church and I really believe that that's what Jesus did, that he liked the underdogs. And he liked, you know, what I, I look at our young people quite often and, and I believe that society, this is my personal belief, that lots of society, I'm, I'm generalizing right now, uh, they look at our young people as, as though they're unlovable and like they're just kind of throwaways. Uh, most of the people we work with don't come from homes that I came from. Uh, they don't have a lot of support. Um, they don't understand the importance of healthy relationship. And they don't think that they're worthy of being loved or that they're worthy um, of being treated with respect or dignity or, or even having success in their lives. And I've struggled with that in my own life, um, even though I come from where I come from. So I just really felt my life was meant to be working with vulnerable people and working with people who needed not um, not a handout, but a leg up. And so with the work that we do at UCAN, where I believe it fits into this, is uh, many of these young people come to our doors and, and you know, they're kind of beat up worn down, tired people who, ju who just need somebody to care about. Um, I worked at a place for years called Oak Hill Boys Ranch out in uh, Bonacle. And those boys, that was some of the, the hardest work I've ever done in my life and, and some of the hardest things I've ever seen in my life where those boys came from. And I realized when I was working there the importance of that relationship. And we were always told, you don't hug the boys. You don't hug them. And I just thought, well, that's stupid. Like, they need that. And um, I'm not saying I'm a big hugger, but I hugged the boys out there. And I treated them with that dignity and that respect. And the thing that I've always taken from the work that I've done is, is I think often we can be in this place where we're, we're the teacher and we're, we're the mentor and where we're the ones that are, are, are showing these people a different way of life, I guess. But they've always taught me way more than I've ever taught them. And they've taught me about being resilient They've taught me about appreciating what we have. They've taught me to be excited about little things in life because those little things actually matter so much more than some of the bigger things that I chase sometimes. And it's been really humbling for me over the years, actually, to work with a lot of the people that I work with. And 
Um, I know that at UCAN, we see some, some, some cool success stories. You know, we, we see some young people that um, come through the agency that have no hope whatsoever whenever they get there. And it takes time, but two, three, maybe four years later, um, they've got a job, they've bought a vehicle, they're paying their own rent, they're buying their own groceries, and, and they've got this smile of hope on them, and, and they're excited about where they're going. Our agency is not a Christian-based organization. Uh, the guy that founded it years ago is a strong Christian guy. Um, I believe that I try to bring my Christian values into the workplace, but on the flip side, it's not something that we, we push or, or pump and all that type of stuff. But I do believe that God's doing really good work within you, Ken, and I believe he always has been. Um, I believe he will continue to do that. And I think that it's a, it's a great place for these young people to come to. They feel safe. Um, they feel like they're, they feel like there's a purpose for them when they show up to, to you can do services. And that's the most important thing for me. Um, I often talk to our staff about the work has to be intentional and we have to have purpose to everything we're doing. We're not, you know, uh, some of my youth workers would want to take a young person to a movie and I love the movies. Um, but I just think, ah, I, uh, one, I think I'm going to pay for two hours to watch a movie, and I'm jealous. And <laughs> the other part of me goes, that's like, let's do things that are more intentional. Let's talk. Let's 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 have this relationship building time, you know, and and, and really show these young people that we are going to show up for them, and that we're going to care about them. So, um, I will tell one story of of a, of a young person, a success story, if that's okay, because it's not just about. Our agency and I, I have a ton of respect for, for the mustard seed, for the amount of volunteers that you guys have, for, for all the intentional work that you do. And of course, knowing Dean and Chris the way that I do, long before them, I, I knew of the mustard seed and, and I knew of the important work that you folks do. And, and uh, so this is just a little story about, you know, a whole lot of people helping a young person. We had a, a young guy named Tyler come to our program years ago and he was 17 and he literally showed up just on our doorstep, so to speak, and we uh, we run a pre-employment program called the Virto Project, and Virto is Latin for turnaround or change, and this young guy had heard about it, he just got out of EYOC, and his story, in a nutshell, uh, when he was 13 years old, he was, a, he was a really good hockey player, and I'm a hockey guy, and I love hockey, and so I, I love this part of his story, but he was so good indeed that, in, in fact, that there were scouts looking at him, there was opportunity potentially for him to get drafted to the WHL and maybe go play some junior hockey and he kind of had some cool things going on in his life. But unfortunately, his background was not going to let him have that life. Uh, dad was in jail for years. Mom had just gone to jail and was going to be in there for years. He was living with his cookum and she had seven other grandkids that she was raising as well. And Tyler, unfortunately, did not have the support, the attention. I, I want to think that Cookham gave him the love, but it was pretty thin at that point. And Tyler ended up being in a gang, a uh, pretty hardcore gang, actually, when he was 13. So when Tyler was about 14 and a half, he was at a party, and opposing gang shows up, and opposing gang starts some ruckus, fight breaks out, Guy pulls a knife on Tyler, Tyler defends himself, him and another fella, and they end up stabbing this guy, and this guy dies. So now Tyler's going to jail for mass fun. Now, in the Young Offender Center and, and in that system, um, he ended up doing two and a half years. Uh, he was let out. But he wasn't allowed to go back to his home. That was part of his release agreement. So he had to live in Edmonton. He had only been to Edmonton twice in his life. He shows up, he heard about us at EYOC, he shows up and says, I don't know what to do. Like, if I can't get into this program, I'm going back to jail. So we take him in. Uh, I don't want to say he was a, he was a hard kid, because he was actually quite funny. He had a good personality. But there was this hardness to him because of the life that he had lived. And so he gets in, and we start looking at employment. And, and one of the questions, and mind you, this was when we were quite a bit smaller uh, as an agency. There was only or if I was working. And we said, what do you want to do? Like, you know, extracurricular. Because it's great when they're with us during the day. We know where they are. We know what's happening. It's whenever they're not with us uh, that we get worried. And he said, well, I'd love to play hockey. 
but I haven't played since I was about 13 and a half and I have no equipment and so we started making phone calls and and you know we had different agencies get involved and all of a sudden boom he was because this was in August and he was had all of his equipment donated paid for uh, and, and Edmonton Minor Hockey Association waived his fees so we could get him into playing on a midget just house league team but here's the problem is he had no one to to drive up there so my mom uh, great lady she used to come in and help tutor some of the young people to help them read uh, she's a librarian and uh, so, she, so she's listening to this and I actually wasn't part of these conversations she was listening to this conversation and the staff are talking saying well we'll have to get the social worker to get them drivers now if you know anything about youth work and working with people which I'm assuming most people here do the best time to build a relationship is in a vehicle uh, for my three sons, it's probably the only time they talk to me. And uh, <clears throat> it's that time where you can actually build a relationship because you, you, you're forced during that little space. So we thought, we don't know if we want this guy to have all these different drivers every day, different person. I mean, he, he, he needs that. And I know the importance of going back and forth from sports events and all that. So uh, my mom does too. So she said, well, you know what? My husband will do. <laughs> so she didn't talk to him she just volunteered my dad's a hockey guy and, and coached a lot of hockey and stuff so anyways my dad agreed to drive him back and forth just for trials just for trials because he's a busy guy he owned a carpet cleaning business this and that so within those four or five drives uh tyler sparked a relationship up with my dad who came from a pretty bad background my dad somehow related to this guy and this guy fell in love with my dad. I had no idea that this was happening, by the way. Um, my dad missed one game all year. We drove him to every. Uh, we went to my mom and dad's at Thanksgiving and Tyler was there. And so we're like, oh, hi, Tyler. How's it going? And and uh, my kids were like, who is this guy? And, you know, what's happening here? <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I mean, I'm a bad dad because I did tell them after. I'm like, you do realize that that guy. Like, well, they were freaking out. And I go, Don't worry, he's okay now. And, and the reason I tell this story is because my dad then hired him to work with him. Um, he worked with my dad for about a year. He did well. My dad had this relationship with him. Um, and I believe that my dad was just pouring Jesus in. You know, he was just loving him no matter what. It didn't matter what he did in the past. My dad knew didn't matter. He knew that this kid needed to be forgiven, that he needed to be lifted up and made whole again. And him, with our agency and other agencies in the city, um, Tyler did incredibly well. And, you know, married, a couple of kids, job, living life the way he's supposed to. And I truly believe it's because, uh, it is my dad, but even if it wasn't my dad, because the guy said, I'll drive him to hockey. I'll build a relationship with him. And then that trust was there, and then he gave him a chance. He didn't give him a handout. He said, work for it. Earn it. And he did. Now he's and hopefully instilling that into his own kid and the stuff that he does. So That's one story of, of, of many successes that we've had. And then you all know that there's many stories of where it didn't work, um, which is always heartbreaking and it's tough to see. But... Um, for me, I believe that, that God plays a major role in me getting into this work by bringing Louie into my life. And I believe that I've always just been able to do this type of work because it's humbled me, it's grounded me. I'm a big believer in grace. Um, I'm a big believer in second chances, third chances, sometimes 10 chances. And we've had many young people that fall and get up, fall and get up fall and get up but it's our job to make sure that we're helping them dust off and keep going. Um, the young person wants to change or keep even if they fall but they want to change we'll continue to work with them um, and we'll continue to support them and, and be so. so in a nutshell that's me that's what we do as an agency um, I'm very inspired by what you all do as an agency, and I know that uh, I've had great conversations with Dean just about a lot of the other innovative things that you guys are doing and bringing into play and social enterprise. There's lots to talk about social enterprise. We've actually gone down that road too. <coughs> good luck to you on that. <laughs> it's a good time. Um, 
but can be very powerful and can work um, if the right people are involved and whatnot. So, so uh, to the Calgary and Red Deer folks, uh, thanks for, for listening and, and uh, appreciate your time. And yeah, I don't know, do you guys do questions or do you guys no, just go, I'll that's just, it? I'll, I'll wind us up. Okay, perfect. Thanks, folks. I appreciate it. So why don't we just close a prayer? And we'll be done. Uh, dear God, thank you uh, for being with us today. Thank you for everything to do uh, in our lives and uh, through the lives of all individuals um, for us to see a world that you would, a world that through your eyes and, and through um, what you would ultimately have us be like. Uh, may we continue to serve uh, you well today. And um, thanks for Kyle and everything you do. Amen. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day.